about new challenges and approaches for Enterprise Java. Is there, if there are any questions, feel free to ask me. Um, let me spend a little bit of time talking about myself. So my name is Eberhard Wolf. Uh, I'm the architecture and technology manager for Adesso. Adesso is um, an IT consultancy in Germany. You can probably tell by my um, English that I'm from Germany. Uh, so I'm a speaker. I wrote the first um, German Spring book and several other books, mostly German. Uh, I do have a blog which is in English. I, I'm on Twitter. Almost all of the tweets are in English. Um, presentations, also all of them in English. And there is an email address if you want to reach me. Okay, so what we are going to talk about is, uh, or what I'm going to talk about is uh, which challenges I see for Enterprise Java in general and uh, which I think um, solutions we have for them or answers we have for them. So let me start by talking about why I think this presentation makes some sense. Java has a broad support in the industry and in particular in the enterprise there is a lot of Java being used. Um, at the same time, the world is changing. So there are no SQL databases. There is the DevOps movement that uh, joins development and operations. There is the cloud, which seems to change quite a few things. And if you look at, in particular, startups and um, what they are doing, they are using those technologies. So I think in the traditional enterprise um, space, there is something to be learned from those startups. And also, if you look at it, quite a few of these things are tied to technologies that are not really Java, like Ruby, for example. So the question is, what is the impact of this whole thing to us as enterprise Java developers? Um, this is sort of, an, well, it's sort of a silly slide. So, I mean, what is Java? So if you look at it, there is the language, there is a programming model called Java E for the enterprise, <coughs> there, is, there are web servers or servers in general, and there is the JVM. I think the most important parts of the SUL Java ecosystems are the servers and the JVM. The reason for that is because they are ubiquitous and also the JVM is well optimized. So if you look at the competitive advantage compared to uh, other ecosystems, I think it boils down to the, uh, to the fact that servers, Java-based servers are everywhere. And that is also why programming languages like Corosia, for example, are running on the JVM and don't, um, don't invent their own virtual machines. So like all these new languages and like all the other things that is, are going on there, I think the enterprise developers also have to ask themselves how they can leverage the, this ecosystems in the best way. Um, yeah, this is all subjective. These are my own uh, opinions and uh, it is obviously hard to predict the future. So this is just my attempt on doing so. So let's start off by taking a look at the traditional web applications that we are probably all used to. So if you look at them, the way they work is there is a browser that talks HTTP uh, to a web application server and um, then HTML is generated on that web application server. And then there is a database or some backend systems that you talk to uh, using JDBC or web services or whatever there is. Um, the role that Java plays in this game is that it renders the HTML. So there is a lot of logic that just takes the stuff from the database, from the backend, and renders HTML out of that. Implemented is this using surflets. So um, the model used here is the surflet model. It uses a thread pool. And if a new request comes in, uh, a thread is taken from the pool. The request is um, surfed, worked on, and uh, then the HTML is uh, generated and returned. In Surflet 3.0, it is possible to suspend and resume handling of a request. The reason is because uh, that way you can uh, free some resources while uh, suspending the, the operations on the request so that more requests can be done in parallel and uh, threads are not hanging around there 
uh, being blocked by I.O. Instead, they, they would be uh, suspended for the time the I.O. takes. However, that is not too easy. So you actually have to call um, a method on the request to suspend uh, the work on the request. Okay, now there are new web applications and if you look at them, they are quite different. So uh, what we are seeing there is a browser that does the HTML rendering implemented in JavaScript. These are the famous one page applications where you have a JavaScript uh, application framework that talks to some NoSQL databases, for example, using HTTP and REST. So there are NoSQL databases that just return the data in JSON, which can easily be used by the JavaScript system in the browser and be rendered into HTML. This used to be something that you would do on the server side using Java. The other thing that is happening is that there are other backend systems that are still implemented using Java. Um, and they talk to the, to the front end using REST and HTTP, which is actually quite similar to the model that you're used to because the model that you're used to using surflets does the same thing. So there is HTTP, there is stuff returned, and speaking REST over HTTP uh, with, let's say, JSON is not that different from what uh, HTML does. However, there are also WebSockets. That's a new protocol. Uh, that allows you to do uh, communication in both directions from the client to the server and the other way around uh, for real-time updates, for example. And this is actually a new challenge, so we will talk about that in more detail. The web or application server is, has a pretty reduced role in this setting because all it does is it just returns basic static HTML, the JavaScript code, and that's it. So there is no, in the most radical form, there is no logic implemented on the web server anymore. It's all done in JavaScript. There might still be logic, and then you would have a, a hybrid between this model and the, the old model, but uh, generally speaking, that's not necessary. So the new thing here, and the new technology here that is that matters are web sockets, and if you Look at it, uh, the other thing that is also happening is that there is more logic in JavaScript. So that means that um, stuff that you would otherwise write in Java is now done in JavaScript. WebSockets is also interesting because um, there is not no standard yet. So if you look at Java E and the standardized Java ecosystem, it doesn't really have an answer to that at the moment. Um, the other problem is the surflet model won't work for WebSockets. The reason is because in the WebSocket space, every client has its own connection. And if you use the surflet model that basically has one thread for each connection, you will have an enormous number of open threads and open connections. And that is not really possible on a server. So, what you need to do is you need to somehow work asynchronously. So first of all, you need to be able to handle more than one connection using one thread because otherwise you will have, uh, the number of threads will be too large. And the other problem is that if there is some I.O. going on and the thread is blocked, then that might have severe consequences because one thread is responsible for quite a few clients and all these clients would wait for the thread to be freed and do its work. So that means that the asynchronous behavior that was added to surflets shouldn't really be an afterthought. It should be baked into the model firsthand. And it should probably be used throughout the stack because uh, if you do some I.O., so you go to the file system, for example, you, it is not, you shouldn't block the current work on the current WebSocket. Instead, another WebSocket should be served while you're waiting for the I.O. on the file and so on. So you should have non-blocking I.O. asynchronous work and so on. There is a way to do that, um, or there is a model that um, is quite a good fit for that, uh, the actor model. The idea of the actor model that um, is implemented in Scala, for example, but uh, also in other languages like Erlang, basically says there is a single-threaded actor that also encapsulates the state. The benefit of this model is that there is just one thread working on the state 
so there is no concurrent access to state, so there is a lot less problems concerning uh, concurrency. The other thing that happens is that this actor um, receives messages and sends messages, and these messages are queued up. So what you can easily do now is you can use this model to work with um, WebSockets. So let's take a look at the actor model in more detail. Um, it's quite a nice model for developers because all they see is a single thread or model, which is nice. It's not too hard to, uh, to reason about it. Concurrency is solved by running uh, multiple actors in parallel. So that's how you get concurrency in there, by just executing, by ha just having more actors. Uh, so for example, one actor for each client. When um, a message is received, it will at one point be handled. So that's asynchronous. There is no waiting, no synchronous communication to the outside. Instead, a message is handled and at one point uh, an answer is sent out. So you can run quite a lot of actors. You can have one thread serving multiple actors and um, working on quite a few message queues. Models that or frameworks that actually implement that is, uh, for example, Akka, uh, which is uh, based on Scala. The other framework that is probably not too well known is uh, Vertex. Vertex is actually, I think, quite an interesting uh, technology. So we are going to talk about. I'm going to talk about Vertex in quite a few places. Um, it is. You can think of it as um, sort of a clone of the ideas in Node.js, so asynchronous uh, behavior, asynchronous programming model, and uh, I think it's quite interesting, as we will see later on, because it actually takes it to, um, to quite a distance. Okay, so that's the actor model, and they are, I believe they are quite a good foundation for WebSockets, because what you can do now is you can just have one actor for each WebSocket, and uh, they, are only, they only do consume resources when a message arrives. So when there are, the thread, the CPU is only really executed and used when there is a message that needs to be worked on. Um, I think this might actually be quite interesting because so far actors have really had their strength in areas where there is a lot of concurrent processing that needs to take place. Um, and in particular in the enterprise space, I'm not sure whether there are a lot of uh, applications that actually have a need for these kinds of parallel processing. Uh, most of the time, the, the enterprise applications that at least I know are concerned with transforming data, handling HTTP requests, and not with complex calculations that need to be parallelized. So I believe that um, Actors are a good fit for the WebSocket model, and for that reason, uh, they actually might um, add some value here to web frameworks and might um, be, become much more popular. Examples of that are uh, the Play framework again, using uh, Akka for WebSockets, and again, the Web Vertex framework, which uses its own uh, actor like model to also handle WebSockets. So to sum up, um, more of the logic, more of the HTML rendering is done in JavaScript instead of Java. I believe the important new technology that might impact the Java world are WebSockets, because if you look at REST web backends, that's not too different from what we are used to. It's just that we are rendering uh, JSON instead of HTML or XML or whatever. But WebSockets are different. I'm not sure how important they actually will be because the, the big benefit of WebSockets is to have communication in both directions. So basically the question is how many uh, applications are you going to implement in the future that actually have um, a server talking to a client and pushing data from the server to the client. If that is the case, then you will probably go for WebSockets and then you will probably need to have a different programming model because WebSockets are hard to uh, support using a model that is, in, uh, that is inspired by uh, surflets, and I believe actors might be a good solution for that.
So that's, I think, the first thing concerning um, HTML and, and web applications. There are other more general uh, issues. If you look at the Java EE model, I mean, uh, what has been criticized in the past is the programming model. And uh, the Java EE model has learned from that and has a pretty much uh, improved programming model there. However, there is also the development model. And the original plan for Java Enterprise was to have one Java EE server that would serve multiple applications. So in my case, there is one Java EE server and there are three applications running on top of that. And that is, if you look at it, what was originally intended with Java EE. However, if you look at the real world today, what you usually end up with is quite a few servers serving the same application. So it's actually quite the opposite. The reason is um, you want to, to use a cluster for load balancing, for easy scaling out, for high availability and so on. And um, you well, can sort of saturate one server already with one application. There are other issues. Um, so the Java E model uh, tries to isolate the applications because each application has its own class loader. So there is no way that the applications can see classes from one another. So in that sense, they are isolated. However, the problem is that it's only the classes that are isolated from one another. So if um, the application server, for example, does garbage collection, then the performance hit will be taken by all applications. So they will all stop. So that means if you talk, if you talk about memory and CPU, actually the applications on a Java EE server are not isolated from one another. And that's a problem because there is no way that you can it doesn't make a lot of sense to run several different applications on the same server if you can't really isolate them because if one application goes nuts, then it hits all the applications. So the isolation in Java EE is sort of half-baked. And the problem is that this half-baked isolation leads to other problems. So if you look at it, um, we all know modularization is a good thing. Uh, so we want to apply that to Java E. And let's assume that we want to uh, deploy those modules independently. So the idea is there's some piece of logic that is shared by multiple applications. And this piece of logic needs to be updated independently from the applications. Because you want to well, simplify the process and so on and so on. That is not possible because models, uh, modules cannot share classes because they are isolated from one another. The only exceptions are ear files. Uh, so in an ear file, you can have several modules and those modules can share classes with one another, but then you still haven't solved the problem because these individual parts of the ear file cannot be deployed independently. So what people usually end up with is um, a system um, that uses uh, the web services uh, anti-pattern, I called it. So what they do is they create a system like this, where there is an application that talks SOAP to some module, and this module again talks SOAP to another module. All the modules uh, are WAR files, and they can obviously be deployed independently because, well, uh, deploying an application or a WAR file is, of course, very possible. However, um, it is a complex and inefficient model because what you do is uh, you are talking over HTTP, over SOAP, over XML uh, to some other system running on the very same machine and you could easily have a local call instead, which would eliminate the XML handling as well as the HTTP and would therefore become be much less complex and also much more efficient. And so this is not really a good solution. This is an anti-pattern because there is so much performance that you're losing there. 
Okay, so we need to have a solution for that. There are other problems as well. Uh, so not too long ago, I was sitting next to a guy in my company and we were trying to solve a problem. And what happened was that we changed some code, we compiled the classes, uh, an ARN script was run and it zipped together a WAR file. That WAR file was deployed, then the WAR file was unzipped and so on and so on. So basically what you're doing is um, you are zipping the whole thing in a WAR file, you're deploying it and you're unzipping it again almost immediately. So all you're doing is you're heating up the CPU and that's it. And it doesn't really solve any problems. It's just a waste of time. And um, that is actually quite unfortunate. And the reason why this is happening is because um, the Java E specification doesn't really talk about an easier model for deployment. You could, which is again sort of strange because if you look at JSPs, I mean, one of the original reasons for JSPs was to the ability to change code in the JSP and get immediate feedback. However, th somehow this was, was lost later on with uh, packaging war files and so on. There are solutions to that. So there is a JRebel that allows you to, um, to deploy new applications or new classes on the run while the system is running without shutting it down. There are solutions like Play, Grails, or the Maven, Tom, uh, Maven Tomcat plugin that um, sort of tries to solve the, the uh, problem in specific circumstances. So they have their own um, environments that are specifically tuned for development. However, there is no general standardized solution. So there is no common solution for all the web servers. And I believe this is quite important because there might be quite a productivity gain because you get um, a much faster turnaround time. So this independent deployment is actually um, quite a significant point. And as I said earlier, there are issues there. Um, I think again, actors might be a solution there because if you look at it, actors already have this message queue where queues are piled up. And the only thing that you need to do is you need to have a way for those actors to work without any shared classes. Now that's not too hard um, and we already know the solution because that's what also what we're doing in this web service anti-pattern. Instead of using shared classes, we use a different mechanism or a different data modeling like JSON for example or XML. Again, Vertex um, has a solution like this built in. So what it has is there is uh, a bus that, you, that uh, can exchange messages and you can use JSON as a payload and then you exactly have, you, you are exec exactly uh, ending up with the model that I'm proposing. So a model where there is um, data modeled as JSON so there are no shared classes. Um, all the communication is asynchronous. So even if you, if you uh, rip out the um, receiver of the messages, the system will still run because the messages are just piled up. And as soon as the system comes, the, the, the actor comes up again, uh, it will work again and work on those messages that have piled up. So that's a solution. However, rather, well, it's, it's early uh, for that solution. Another solution that comes to mind is OSGI. It's interesting because uh, nowadays OSGI is actually gaining traction on the server. So if you look at the most popular Java E servers, they actually do have support for OSGI. Um, and the OSGI solution is probably the most complete solution. However, it's also quite complex. The reason why it is so complex is because OSGI allows you to reload classes at, at runtime, which is exactly what I want. I want to be able to redeploy parts of my application, so I need to reload classes. However, that's not too easy. In particular, it's not too easy when several modules somehow share classes. Um, and it only go, it takes you so far. I mean, the main 
uh, with GI application these days probably is Eclipse and uh, when you update Eclipse and you, you load new updates you usually, you usually have to restart so it means that even in this uh, sort of most important application there is for OSGI, even in that application it's not easy to redeploy modules without restarting the system. So that might be an alternative and um, yeah, it's actually quite nice that it's now implemented in quite a few servers so that's great. Um, the other thing that you can couple up with are embedded servers. So the idea here is instead of deploying the application to a server which at the end of the day really doesn't make a lot of sense because you won't deploy more than one application to your server as I said earlier. In the most cases you will just deploy one single application because you can't isolate more than one application anyway. So instead of doing that which is sort of pointless because you're not sharing a server you just start a Java application that includes the server. Um, yeah that might e even be easier so customizing the server is quite easy so it's just a part of the thing that you are uh, that you are giving to the customer and if there are specific JVM parameters it's just going to be part of what you give to the customer so the shell script that is running the, uh, the application or whatever. However again this is not covered by standard deployments so standard deployments only talk about WAR files, ear files and so on. The programming model will be very similar. However, this uh, deployment model using embedded servers is quite different and it's not covered by the standard. Of course, you can still do it. So I think if you look at it, um, the deployment model should probably be improved. Um, I think embedded servers are quite interesting. I will talk about a few other problems or a few other reasons why I believe uh, this to be interesting. OSGI is, I would say, complex. It is a very, um, it's, it's a very good solution. It's a very complete solution, but it's rather complex. And there are some alternatives. Again, Vertex, um, as I said, JRebel, it's not a complete list. There might be other technologies that also solve some problems. Okay, then there is the famous cloud. Again, the question is why would I even care? So why is this something that I as a Java developer would care about? The reason I believe is it's much easier to create a new environment. So um, if you look at the typical cloud environments, basically uh, you just take the application, you deploy it to an environment, and you're done. So there is no purchase for a new server. There is n you don't really have to wait for a long time until the application is there. It is just pressing a button at one point, and then you get the application running. The other, prop the other benefit that's more like a management um, cost type of thing, you only pay what you need. So you only pay the resources that you're consuming at one specific point. So instead of buying a server for $10,000, you just, um, well, rent a server for a few hours and see whether it works, um, and then uh, that's it. And it would just cost you a few bucks. So that's great. However, there are challenges. And I believe the main problem is that servers can and will fail. So if you look at what we as enterprise developers are used to, we have this highly available uh, hardware and a server that is failing is really a bad thing. And someone in operations uh, will have, well, will have to report to his boss and answer the question why the server failed. In the cloud, that is more or less what is happening all the time. So if you look at the Amazon terms and conditions, what they say in a way is, if one of our data centers fails, uh, that's fine and you have to deal with it. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Uh, actually, I believe it's a, it's a good thing because it will, we will end up with uh, architectures that are more stable and, uh, more, and can deal with uh, individual servers failing. 
The other thing, if you look at it, so you're paying what you use. So that means you should only use what you really need at a specific point in time. So instead of the traditional enterprise systems where you would just scale your system to, or your, where, where you would size your servers to the maximum load, and the cloud, that's not a good idea. What you need to do is you need to have some means to uh, scale up and down so that depending on the load, the, the right uh, amount of resources are consumed. Okay, so what's the impact on Java then? Well, um, the approaches that we need to support are uh, scale out. So we need to start new servers if there is high load. We need to stop servers when there is lower load. And replication data, uh, replicating data is also quite important. Um, there are some impacts. So if you look at HTTP sessions, for example, so in an HTTP session, you can store specific data for one user that is logged into the system. Um, and if the server the user is connected to fails, then usually the HTTP session information is lost. You can set up um, clustering, however, that consumes quite a few resources uh, because the information for the HTTP session would need to be replicated across to at least one other server, probably also quite a few more servers if you really want to have high availability. And it only really works with a small number of servers. So I think one of the impacts of this whole system is that you will probably end up with applications that don't really use HTTP sessions and you need to store the data elsewhere. So on the database, um, on the client, HTML5 local storage actually gives you a good way to store a significant amount of uh, data on the client. Or you can have alternative solutions for the HTTP session. So one cloud environment that uh, we are using internally at Adesso um, we have set up a memcached cluster to uh, store all the HTTP session information and that cluster is highly uh, available. So if one of the servers in the cluster fails, then uh, the data is still replicated across to other nodes. And that is plugged into Tomcat as an, ex uh, as an external session storage mechanism. So that's an alternative. Reason, by the way, was that uh, the software that we are running in the cloud um, is using the HTTP session. So the alternative would have been to do a rewrite, which we didn't really want to do. So to sum up this case, so session application is not that useful in the cloud because servers might fail and it's probably better to store your data somewhere else. And um, because session replication isn't that important, simple servers that don't really support session replication or are not configured to use session replications are more important or preferable in the cloud. Then the other thing that's like the, probably the, the basic uh, thing about uh, cloud or one of the most important uh, theorems about cloud is the cap theorem. It says, there are three properties that your system might have. So consistency says all nodes in the system see the same data or have the same data store. Availability basically says you're not shutting down an individual node. And P is partition tolerance. So if uh, there is a network failure, the system still runs. And what the cap theorem uh, says is pick any of those two. You can talk about it in more detail, so I could spend probably an hour or so uh, discussing it in more detail, but that's uh, the short version. So in the cloud, machines do actually fail. There is no high availability. So at one point, uh, there will be a partition. So you will have a system where at least two systems can't talk to each other because there is a failure of one kind or another. So at that point, you either have to sacrifice A or C. So that means at that point, you either have to detect the um, condition and shut down one of the systems. So you would sacrifice A. Um, 
shutting down the system of course means that you're sacrificing parts of the availability or you would still give answers and return data even though you're aware of the fact that you can't talk to the other node and the other node might have inconsistent data. So you would sacrifice consistency. Um, why is this important? I think it's interesting because it's actually a contradiction to what we are used to. So if you look at the two-phase commit protocol, um, it is basically meant to have multiple systems and make them consistent. So what the two-phase commit protocol does is it says, okay, here are some databases. In the first phase, I'm gonna ask all the databases whether they can write the data. And in the next phase, if all the systems agree that the data can be written and is valid, the data will actually be written. So the idea is to coordinate the systems in those two phases by having a vote first and then actually writing the data, you're coordinating the systems in a way that uh, they are consistent. However, if during the process uh, your network connection goes down, then you do have a problem and you are not able to successfully uh, make all the systems consistent. So that means that the two-phase commit protocol is actually not that great a fit for the cloud because usually in the cloud the trade-off is to um, be partition tolerant and either sacrifice say a C or A but not P because systems might fail. I'm not saying that it doesn't make any sense whatsoever to use two-phase commit protocol in the cloud. If you have a limited system and you can deal with failures it might still be okay but what I am saying is it's not the ideal system for the cloud and not the ideal protocol for the cloud. So bringing that back to Java, usually this is accessed uh, using the JTA API and the two-phase commit protocol and the implementation of the two-phase commit protocol is actually, in my opinion, one of the main differences between Java E servers and simple web servers like Tomcat. Why? because all the other features nowadays can be implemented using libraries. So there are libraries that would allow you to use EGBs, JSF, CDI, all the nice features of Java E. However, it's different for JTA. There are ways to integrate a, a two-phase commit protocol in Tomcat, but that's a rather complex solution and you probably don't want to go there. Also, it is quite hard to implement such a transaction system correctly. Uh, because you really have to make it bulletproof. Because if you don't, that's the whole reason why you're using two-phase commit pro uh, protocol from the start, because you really want to make sure that in a case of an error, you still have transactions and it still works for you. And also, it is uh, something that influences databases and uh, all the other resources. So uh, that means that uh, it is something that uh, influences the basic of your uh, web server. It goes through to all the different resources you might have. Okay, so that again means that simple web servers that don't really implement two-phase commit protocol um, are a better fit for the cloud because the lack of two-phase commit protocol isn't that bad a thing. Um, and there are other reasons. So simple web servers won't include all the features that Java E servers have. So you can basically come up with your own uh, libraries in your own applications and you will consume less resources because all the libraries that you don't want, well, you won't in include them in your application and you end up with a solution that consumes less resources, which is great because all the resources you're consuming, you actually pay for. So these simple web servers uh, like Tomcat and other solutions are actually preferable in the cloud. And if you look at it, that's actually also what people are doing. So Tomcat is used in Amazon. It's also used in Cloud Foundry. Uh, in Heroku, there is Tomcat Jetty or uh, a wide variety of embedded, other embedded servers that you can use. So Play, for example, is supported there as well. There is an even more uh, limited system on Google App Engine. 
So it's uh, based on JTI, I think, but there is a white list of classes that you can use on Google App Engine. So it's a very limited implementation of Java. CloudBees offers Java e Web Profile, so that's uh, a little bit broader. And then there is Red Hat and Oracle uh, who are offering full stack Java e. So if you look at it, uh, there are quite a few big players like Amazon or Heroku or Google that are actually doing exactly what I'm, what I'm proposing, using very simple web servers in the cloud instead of full-blown Java e servers because it, is, it consumes less resources and the features in the Java e servers are not that important for the cloud, like two-phase commit protocol. So again, Cloud is also a reason for using simple web servers like Tomcat, for example. Uh, yeah, multi-tenancy, that's actually a good point. So it's very, it's interesting because um, if you look at it, there are several different ways of implementing multi-tenancy. So one way of implementing multi-tenancy is what they are doing in Java E7, which is basically storing specific, which is basically sort of adding a hook to your OR mapper, and then uh, you say, okay, if there is uh, a query, you add something to the query that says only return the data for the current uh, tenant. That's what they are doing. Um, the model here is that you're running one instance of your application to support multi-tenancy. So you log into the application, two tenants log into the very same application, and they see their own data. That's basically how it works. Um, there are other ways to do that in the cloud. So what you could do is you could run two virtual machines with two different instances of the application. So one user from one tenant would connect to an instance specific to that tenant, and the other user would connect to a different machine with a different tenant, which is, by the way, not too, too bad. I think it's probably even better. It, it has it, it, its advantages because there is a stronger separation, right? Basically, the only reason, the only way to escape your machine is by some bug in the virtualization layer, which is probably not there. Um, also, it is easier to separate them, again, concerning garbage collection, CPU consumption, and so on. And for that reason, I actually believe that uh, this situation is probably not going to change uh, because there is just this one, this one way that uh, multi-tenancy is currently, as far as I know, to be supported in Java E7. And that's just one way of doing it. And in particular, in the cloud, there are other ways. So I mean, one of the reasons why we introduced this cloud system that I've been talking about before is, uh, at Adesso is because we wanted to have a, an even better separation between the tenants and a better uh, service level that we could offer to them. So, and we do that by separating them on the virtual machine level. Because previously we, we tried to do that by use, having multi-tenancy in, in the application itself, and that only takes you so far. Okay, any other questions? So, thanks a lot. Okay, so that's it. So my point was that if you look at the cloud, that's another good reason for simple web servers like Tomcat. Then there is cloud architecture. So again, as I said, the main point is in the cloud, servers might fail. This also has an impact on the architecture of your applications. So if you look at traditional, um, at your traditional application, you would probably uh, end up separating your web server from a database server. That makes a lot of sense because the uh, characteristics of a database server is quite different from the characteristics of a web server because, well, there is more I.O., more disk, and so on. Problem is, if you look at it, the probability for this service to fail is about twice the probability of one individual server failing maybe we can do better. And obviously we can by uh, having the web and the database server running on the same machine. Now, 
this seems a little bit strange because usually web and database servers uh, are, well, have different requirements in terms of uh, the hardware they need. However, um, if you look at the NoSQL space in particular, um, there are databases that have uh, less hard requirements on the hardware. So using a NoSQL database actually makes that a pretty good option. Um, and also with replication and so on in the NoSQL space, that's definitely doable. So what you en will end up with is uh, a system where you will probably uh, separate your system in services, smaller independent services, to uh, keep the results of a failure low. So if one of the servers in this case fails, it will only mean that one service fails, not the whole application. Um, and probably you will end up with this separation because those services might fail for different reasons. So a customer service might talk to your CRM system and might fail if the CRM system is down, uh, or they might use different databases. So it might be wise to uh, separate them. Remember, however, there is the first law of distributed objects, and that says don't distribute your objects. So what you should be do, what you should think about in this case is still whether you will really want to separate your application in different uh, servers because that might cause a performance overhead because of distributed communication and so on. There are ways to solve that. So if you look at uh, the system that I've, uh, that I've just spoken about, you could, for example, say, okay, each of these services has its own HTML front end. And if I open a page that is specific to a specific server, a service, you go to that server and get the HTML from that very server. And then you don't have distributed objects. Instead, it's just where your HTML and HTTP comes from. Challenges, well, we have more services. We have more server. Um, infrastructure overhead caused by Java E is even less acceptable. And even the JVM might be a problem in this regard. Um, and it is also, it's sort of a contradiction to the EA model where you have all the modules in one place in one server. So it's very, very different in that regard. And this is, by the way, really hard challenge. I mean, if you look at the JVM, the JVM has this problem that it ha it's rather memory inefficient because of the way that garbage collection is done. And that in turn means if you really want to run a lot of JVMs on a, virtual, on, on a cloud environment, you're probably going to uh, consume a lot of resources, which will cost a lot of money. So uh, cloud needs these small services. That's, again, not a great fit for Java E and maybe not even for the JVM. So we'll see about that. OK, so another techn technology challenge is NoSQL. The thing to, point, to note here is uh, NoSQL is actually not just one specific technology. The most simple technology, NoSQL technology, are key value stores. So they just store a value um, under a specific key. It's like a map, basically, like a Java map. That only takes you so far. So what people came up with is the idea of these large column stores. And then there is a key, and you actually get um, a structured, structured data that contains multiple columns. Document-oriented stores, uh, well, give you documents. For large column as well as document uh, stores, you can actually have queries. So return all the uh, documents or all uh, the data sets that have a specific characteristic. And then there are graph databases um, that have nodes, edges, and properties, and so on and so on. None of these support joins. The reason is if you do a join, you, ba you basically have to have all the data in one place, calculate the join 
filter it out and so on. And that means that you lose the ability for horizontal scalability. So you can't distribute your data across multiple servers anymore because you have to have a way to get all the data in one place. And that's sort of a contradiction. So I think that's like the basic limitation of NoSQL. Um, choosing one of these technologies is clearly a, a, a trade-off. So if you look at it, you would use one of these technologies because there is a specific problem that you're facing and you want to use one of these because um, they have specific strength. So if you look, even if you look at one specific NoSQL flavor, there is still a choice to be made. So Redis, for example, is a key value store. It's in memory, it's very fast, but because it is in memory, there is only so much data you can store. React is very different, that's very scalable, so you can store a very, very large amount of data in it. So I believe a standard really does make a lot of sense because it will, would level these strengths and would sort of make it pointless because the reason, I mean, the reason or the, the, the main message behind, behind NoSQL is basically here is the choice of technology. Um, choose the technology that is the best fit for your scenario. And a standard really doesn't make a lot of sense there. Um, so that also means that a general universal NoSQL Java API doesn't really make a lot of sense because there are so many different ways of doing it. In particular, JPA is a bad fit for it uh, because JPA depends on the relational model and it uses joins, for example. And as I said earlier, joins in NoSQL doesn't make a lot of sense because it would basically sacrifice um, horizontal scalability. Now, of course, there are general concepts in JPA that you can use with any data store, like the entity annotation, for example. And you could somehow tweak it to make it work. You know, you, you, know, you could say, okay, so we are using add entity, we are using some other annotations, but sorry, no joins. But that's sort of pretty weird because, I mean, the reason for, for having a standard in the first place is that it's, well, the standard. So you just program to the standard and it just works. Using that approach would basically mean, well, you know, um, so you can use add entity, uh, but all the other stuff is not usable. So um, it's not really the standard. So it is in a way proprietary because there are limitations. Actually, this is what, what the Google App Engine does with its uh, NoSQL data store. So they are using JPA. And there are other projects that do similar things. I think a much better approach um, is what Spring Data does. So if you, the, the idea of Spring Data is actually from uh, the original Spring project. And the idea is to have all these different APIs that are out there like Hibernate, JPA, and JDBC and have an abstraction of top, on top of that that unifies the parts of the specific APIs that can be unified, like the exceptions, for example, or to make the API similar. So exceptions, I mean, you can come up with all the errors you might ever have, like there might be a constraint problem, there might be a problem with uh, a general problem of some kind, and so on and so on. And you can build up exceptions for each of them and uh, use them for all the APIs. And that's what Spring originally did. It's not a full abstraction, so you can still use the specific parts of the API, or the Hibernate classes, or the JPA classes, or the JDBC classes, if you need to. And this model is actually a good fit for NoSQL, because again, you have, you have the same problems, the same exceptions, and they can be unified. Um, and you can still have a way to access the specifics of these APIs. So if there is a specific, so Redis has some specific uh, features like a messaging service, for example, and that can easily be used using the proprietary API, while there might be a general key value API that can be used with Redis as well as React, which makes a lot of sense. And the reason why it makes sense is because it's easier to learn. 
So once you're using, you are used to the general idea of spraying data, it's easier to learn specific NoSQL databases. And there are additional things. So it's easy to create a repository or data access object because that's supported by Spring Data. So if you want to have your CRUD operations, that's easy to do. And there is support for REST services. So it's quite easy to come up with a REST service on top of an existing database. Um, the other impact that NoSQL has is shown in this graph that I showed before. So basically direct access from JavaScript to the database in the backend instead of going through uh, your middle tier that would reside on a web or application server. Um, so what I think is interesting is that JavaScript is becoming very important in the NoSQL space because quite a few uh, document-oriented databases uses JSON as a data representation. Uh, and if you look at MongoDB, for example, there is a strong JavaScript support for queries and these kinds of things. So in a way, that's like JDBC and relational database uh, systems. So it seems that JavaScript is very important for the NoSQL uh, databases, while Java is only a secondary concern. So to sum up, NoSQL is hard to standardize because it's such a broad variety of technologies. JPI is not a good fit for this model. And I would suggest to look at Spring Data because it makes life easier concerning NoSQL databases. It's not a complete solution, so there are just, there are not all NoSQL databases are supported, but at least a few important ones. Yeah, last point, DevOps. So DevOps is, um, basically says that development and operations uh, cooperate, collaborate more strongly. And continuous delivery is one of the practices of DevOps. And it says that you should automate and optimize the pipeline that leads to, res uh, to your releases. Um, we are going to have a keynote about that tomorrow. So I'm looking forward to that. What does that mean for uh, for us, well, first of all, continuous delivery is an important part of DevOps. Um, and because at least during deployment, development and operations have to collaborate. It's no, there is no way that one of these two parties can do uh, a successful deployment on their own. So the impact on Java I think what is interesting is that uh, quite a few of the continuous delivery tools are written in Ruby, like Puppet or Chef uh, or some of the other ones. So what I'm seeing, at least in my company, is that this might strengthen Ruby. And if you, so what is happening there is that people start using Ruby for these automations and then they start using it for other things in the projects as well. Um, and if you look at it, that's also how Java got started. So Java originally started with applets, and now nobody is basically doing applets anymore. Instead, we are using it for enterprise application development, and maybe something similar is going on in this space. And that's also different from continuous integration, where we have quite a few Java tools. The impact on environments, again, if you look at it, these continuously, uh, continuous delivery tools uh, in a way compete with uh, server and cluster management tools um, because these continuous delivery tools allow you to set up a cluster of application servers quite easily. Uh, and that was one of the uh, advantages of some Java E servers that they, have, that they have a more sophisticated way of handling a large number of cluster nodes and that is uh, being leveled now by continuous delivery. So again, here you can see that simpler ser simple services, uh, simple servers are uh, preferred, and the missing management features that some of them have uh, can be compensated by those continuous delivery tools. So again, uh, we see, I, I think we will see a push here for simple web servers we will see probably a push for Ruby in this space, and that's another impact. 
So this should be it. Yeah. So um, thanks a lot for listening. <laughs>